Would you join your hearts in prayer with me now? Let's go before the throne of grace. Father, we come before you this morning as the one in whom we, your children, have taken refuge. You have delivered us in your righteousness. So now we ask, Father, that you would incline your ear to us, that you would be to us this morning a rock of strength, a stronghold to save us. As we recognize that you are indeed our fortress and that for your name's sake you have promised to lead and guide each of your children even this morning. Help us then, Father, resting upon this promise to wait in silence for you only. For our hope is from you, you alone. And we as children trust in your loving kindness. Help us to wait upon your name, for it is good. Father, we thank you this morning. We praise your most holy name for the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. For as we have come confessing our sins, Father, as we have heard of the assurance of salvation that we have, we praise your most holy name. We thank you that Christ was sent, that the second person of the Trinity, your very Son, to take on a human nature, flesh, that he might live under the law, that he might satisfy every jot and tittle, that he might be righteous, fully righteous in your sight, Father. That he might go to the cross, that he would suffer and die, taking upon himself your eternal wrath for our sins, for the sins of each and every child of God. We thank you that he rose from the dead, that he defeated death, even sin. That the grave could not hold him, that Satan was defeated by his awesome power. We thank you for his resurrection this morning. We thank you for the power that it displays. We thank you for the resurrection's work in our hearts. We thank you for his ascension. The fact that our high priest sits even now ruling and reigning at your right hand, that he is interceding for us even now as we petition you. We thank you for the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the justification we have in our Savior. We thank you that you have declared us righteous, not because of what we have done, but because of what our Savior has done. Because he's kept the law, because he satisfied your justice. And so now you've declared your children, those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, as innocent in your sight. Forgiven our sins. We thank you for the justification we have. Father, we ask that you would continue to work within our hearts. That your spirit would continue to abide within us. That he would continue leading and guiding us in your word. That he would open it to us daily, Father. Thank you for his work, and we pray that you would increase the work of the Spirit within each of our hearts, continuing to sanctify each one of us, conforming us more and more to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your patience, Lord, with us. As sanctification is a long process, and yet you are a loving, an eternally loving God and long-suffering. We thank you for your patience with us. Father, we pray that you would cause your kingdom of grace, even this morning, to advance. Through this service of worship, through the reading, the preaching of the word, through the singing of our hymns, through even this prayer, that the kingdom of grace would continue to advance, even in this place, amongst us. We pray that more souls would be added to our number. That our songs would be joined together in unison the kingdom of grace would grow. 
Father, we also pray for the kingdom of Satan to be destroyed, for you to continue to destroy it. We know you've begun, and we pray for that work to continue to its end. Father, we pray for our missionaries. We pray that you would uphold and sustain them in their work. As they're working in a particular corner of the kingdom of grace, that it would continue to advance wherever they are this morning, in China, in Uganda, in Uruguay. Be with our brothers and sisters as they minister to those in darkness. We pray for the light of Christ to be shown very brightly in each of those nations. Father, this morning we pray very particularly for those amongst our body who are experiencing pain and suffering, physical, physical afflictions. We think very specifically of Tom Waldecker, our brother in Christ. We thank you, Lord God, for his devotion that you have placed upon his heart, for his years of ministry. We thank you, Lord God, that even now in, on his bed as he ministers to us. We pray, Lord God, that you would comfort him this morning, that you would grant him peace within his body, that you would relieve him of pain and discomfort, Father, if that be your will. Father, we pray for healing, if that be within your will. Bless him, Lord God, even in this affliction that you would draw him closer to Christ. We pray for Judy. We pray for strength. We pray for comfort. Please uphold her as she continues to care for her husband. We thank you for the, their beautiful marriage and how it displays to us the love of Christ. Continue working in their hearts, Father, and help us to be that church that would surround them with Christian love. Father, we also pray for our sister, Debbie Hastings. We ask, Lord God, for healing. We pray that it might be your will that she would join us, rejoin us here in, in this place in worship, that this place would become such that she could worship with us. And we pray that you'd bless Debbie and Rich as they worship today in Royston. Strengthen our brother and sister. Bless them. And heal Debbie. Father, we also pray for our pastor this morning. We ask, Lord God, that you would refresh him as he takes a vacation. We pray that you'd be with him, that you'd lift him up, Lord God, that you'd give him the rest that he needs, rejuvenate his body, his mind. And even in this time, Father, we pray that you'd draw him closer to Christ Jesus, that he would be leaning and depending upon his Savior in all things. Bless his time with his family. Continue to acclimate them to life here in the United States. Help us, Father, to be a congregation that blesses our pastor. Father, we ask all of these things in the strong name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That brings us to our giving of our tithes and offerings. This is a blessed time of, of our worship service where we're able to give back a portion of that which God has given to us. Let's give with joyful hearts this morning.
you please rise and give thanks to our God by singing the Gloria Patri number 734 in the Trinity Hymnal. <laughs> This morning is number 193, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence, number Open up your copy of God's Word now to the Gospel of John. We'll continue considering that letter to us. In the first chapter, we'll be reading verses 6 through 18. It'll be found on page 1,127 of your pew Bible. Let's hear now the Word of God. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. As far in the reading of God's word, amen. Please pray with me. Our Lord and God, we now ask for your blessing upon the reading of the word. As we have now heard, we pray that the Spirit would indwell, that he would work powerfully, opening our eyes, our hearts, our minds to understand the glory of Christ. Be with us now. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Some of you might have heard that this past week on Monday there was an eclipse. A solar eclipse. My understanding is what happens is that the moon moves in such a way that it comes between the earth and the sun uh, very specifically and then it blocks out the sun at some point in time. Some of you might have gone and seen it. Particular places in the United States, as the moon, as the moon came in direct uh, the frontage of the sun, it was complete blackness. People flocked to those places where the eclipse was total. And we were told and told and told, don't look at the sun directly. It could hurt your eyes. It would be too bright. The sun's light is so bright that you, if you fix your eyes upon it, you can injure your eyes. You must have some sort of filter. There were those glasses, you know, handed out, I guess purchased by some. So you could watch. It was only when the sun was completely covered over by the moon, then you could take your glasses off and gaze upon those spectacular colors. Those beads of light peeking through the valleys of the moon's surface, all bringing glory to God. I think that picture of the eclipse is going to help us a bit this morning in understanding what John has for us as he's describing the light, which is Jesus Christ. We're continuing, obviously, in our study of the Gospel of John. We just began a few weeks ago with those first five verses where we were studying, where we were opening up, where John was telling us of the divinity of the Son of God, the second person, the Word. That's what he was focused upon. Immediately, right out of the box, John was telling us who the Word is. In the beginning, with God. The divine nature. He was and is the Creator. He made all things. Nothing that was made was made without Him. And in Him was life. Telling us that the Son of God... Even Jesus Christ is, in fact, God himself. And now, as John continues that introduction for here, verses 6 through 18, he continues to tell us who Jesus Christ is in a very broad picture. Here in these verses that we have before us this morning, he's introducing us to that other nature of Jesus Christ, the human nature. That the second person, that God himself condescended, he lowered himself to take on a human nature. So John opens up this gospel with these two headlines. That Jesus is fully God. And Jesus is fully man. Both of which will be borne out as we continue through the gospel of John. This morning we're going to be thinking about Jesus as being fully man. It's rare, 
I'm not sure that I've ever heard it before, of someone to actually give an application as they are giving a contextual introduction to a sermon. But I think I need to. Because what I want us to see here is as John opens up this gospel that you are all familiar with, what does he do? Where does he begin? He begins with the two natures of Jesus Christ, God and man. John, the inspired writer, did this. He thought it was a good place to start, to tell others about Christ. Yes, John was an inspired writer, but remember, he was writing the words of God. This was not just a good idea that John had. This was God's idea to introduce us to Christ by telling us that Christ is God himself and that he condescended to take on a human nature. How do you share the gospel? We might be thinking of that as we go throughout this text this morning. How do we share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we begin with Jesus, with his two natures? It's not a command. I'm not suggesting that it is. It's not a sin if you don't. But we may want to consider beginning there. This passage, I think, might lead us to that point. As we go through these verses today, I want us to see that the glory of God is put on display as the glory of men is redefined and the Lord Jesus Christ shines brightly in and through his human nature. We'll see that in three points. First, redefining the glory of men. Secondly, veiling the glory of God. And thirdly, revealing the glory of Christ. Well, first, redefining the glory of men. We might be enticed to think that this portion of Scripture is about John the Baptist. As it opens up, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. It's really not about John the Baptist. It's not John the Gospel writer's focus to fix his mind and fix our mind upon John the Baptist. You have to ask the question, why even mention him? Because really, this These couple of verses are sandwiched between verses about Jesus Christ, the Word, and the light. Why even mention John the Baptist? I think what John the Gospel writer wants us to see is there is a need for a witness. Why does he describe Jesus Christ as the light? Is it not because... Man, because we are a fallen people? Because through the fall, through our sin, everything has been corrupted and nothing is working properly. We are no longer able, the folks that John was writing to were no longer able to see clearly. And if they couldn't see clearly, then they couldn't see the glory of God. Think for a minute about Adam and Eve. Think about how they saw their heavenly father in the garden before the fall. Their eyes were not blinded by sin. As they looked upon God, they could understand and grasp his glory. But after the fall, Their hearts no longer translated what they saw as being the glory of God. Indeed, they were unable to translate it as being His glory. God was no longer glorious to them. And as such, they no longer desired to worship Him. Their pure eyesight, their pure hearts were now defiled by the guilt of sin. They were no longer in any position to gaze upon God directly. They needed a witness. They needed someone to translate for them what God is and how to understand his glory and to truly see it. I think that's why John the Baptist here is described as a witness. I think that's why Jesus Christ is described as the light. Because John was truly a witness. 
But he was a witness to the real light, to the true witness, Jesus Christ. John was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. John's work was preparatory. He was a witness. That's why he's mentioned here, but the focus is on Christ. He was calling others to see, to look upon Christ Jesus, the true light. It was not unimportant work. It was critical work, but it was preparatory work. The true witness was coming, and the glory of Jesus was redefining the glory of men. If we get to chapter 3 of John, we'll see that John the Baptist understood his position, that he was not the bridegroom, but he was the friend of the bridegroom, that he must decrease and that Christ must increase. A bit like that eclipse of the sun, where men would be the sun and, and Jesus Christ would be the moon coming in front and blocking out that which we might gaze upon, which we might want to see. And we tend to set up men on pedestals and, and Jesus Christ comes and eclipses that. And then he redefines. The coming of Jesus Christ redefined the glorious work of men. John's work as proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ as coming was glorious work. It's the true glory of men, isn't it? The glory of men is not within themselves. It was not to lift themselves up. Indeed, Paul was given a thorn in the flesh to guard him against lifting himself up. And Christ comes and redefines the glory of men. It's not within you. It's me. It's not the messenger. It's the message. Isn't that what the whole Gospel of John is all about? These are written so that you may believe. The whole purpose of John's Gospel was not to raise himself up, but to raise Christ up. To raise up the message so that many might be brought to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the glory of men. To recognize and acknowledge and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as the true light. That might just cause us to consider how we begin telling others about the gospel. Do we begin with the Lord Jesus Christ, our glory? That brings us to our second point. After Jesus Christ has redefined the glory of men, now he veils the glory of God. You might seem to say that's a strange way to put what Christ did, to veil the glory of God. I would put that moral on, on men. That's what men do. Men veil the glory of God. In fact, they deny the glory of God. That's the problem that John sets forth for us, doesn't he, in verse 10. He, meaning Jesus Christ, the Word was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. <clears throat> he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. That is the problem which the Son of God was sent to solve. The world did not know him. That was the case then. That is the case now. If you watched the news reports of the eclipse, you might have seen some of the things that I saw. What were the reactions of people as, as the moon moved into position across the sun? Did you hear shouts of praise to Almighty God? Did you hear people breaking out into hymns and songs of praise for the Lord Jesus Christ? Did, did you see the interviewers describing or having people describe to them the intricate workmanship of God as these heavenly bodies moved in precision? I didn't see that. I heard praise to the material world, to Mother Nature, to the sun, to the moon. I heard shouts and cheers, not for God, not for God the Creator, but for the creation itself. 
I saw worship of the creation. I heard people rejoicing that they were celebrating, coming together, becoming a community. Why? Because they were looking upon heavenly bodies. I heard the exaltation of science, or the wisdom of men, above the wisdom of God. Well, how could this be? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. See, that's, that's what we heard on Monday over and over again, the wisdom of men being poured out over the highways and the byways, over the airways, the internet connections. We heard the wisdom not of God, but of men being proclaimed. We heard the denial of the glory of God. The ascribing of glory to science, in other words, to men, to a creation in which the wisdom of men exists independently of the Creator, the world had given the glory of God to another. It was the same in the days of John. And so John is calling, he's calling for men, for women, for children to see the glory of God through Jesus Christ and to stop refusing to give glory to God. You see, all of this is really bound up in the suppression of the truth of the glory of God in unrighteousness. Man's attempt to eclipse the glory of God with the glory of men. And that leads very logically to the refusal to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what does God do in response? He veils his glory, doesn't he? In the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 14, and the word became flesh. You see, Jesus Christ emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of men. He was found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death. He veiled God's glory with his human nature so that he could save. You see, that's the true eclipsing of the glory of God by Jesus Christ as he condescends to take on a human nature, to do that which was necessary in order to save a people for himself. Think of it this way. Well, why were the scientists so excited about the eclipse? It's because they, because we, know so little about the sun. If you open up Wikipedia and start studying well, how hot is the sun, you find out that some people believe the core is like 27 million degrees. I don't know how they get that number. But then as you go out, as you go out from the core, it becomes cooler. At some points, about 10,000 degrees. But then, then if you study the corona, then the temperature bumps up to over 3 million degrees. Why is that? Scientists don't know. And so as the moon comes in front of the sun and eclipses it, now they're able to study the corona. It's, it's isolated. You're able to gather data and information. They're so excited because now they can get to see and understand a bit more of the nature and the makeup of the sun. Isn't that what Jesus Christ does? Isn't that what he did? As he took on flesh, as he condescended, as he, as he veiled the glory of God of himself, doesn't he truly reveal to us more of who God is, more of his love, more of how he is willing to humble himself so that we might be saved. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did. 
so that we might know God, know His Father. Because He took on a human nature now, now we are able to gaze upon the living and true God and understand, not completely, but to grasp His glory. To do that which Adam and Eve could not do as they were exiting from the garden. As Jesus Christ has now come and veiled the glory so that then we could see it. That brings us to our third point, describing the glory of Christ. And that's exactly what John does here. He begins to describe, he gives us a headline about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what is glory? What, what do you think of when you think of the glory of God? What comes to mind? It's something we speak of often. But if you were having to explain it to someone who had never heard of Jesus Christ, who didn't know the scriptures, how would you explain glory? Well, the dictionary tells us it's brightness, it's luster, it's splendor, it's visible splendor. Brightness shed. John tells us here a couple of things about the glory of Christ. First, that it's that which can be seen. Secondly, it's, it's his being the only son of the Father. Third, it's, it's grace and truth that he embodies. And fourth, it's making God the Father known. When we do this, when we break down things like this, it doesn't mean that we can parcel out and say, well, that's this portion of his glory and this is this portion of his glory. I just want us to try to get a better grasp of how John is describing to us the glory of Christ. Well, first, it's, it's the glory that can be seen. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Now, that is a curious thing. John would describe the glory of Christ as something that he saw. Because how does Isaiah describe Christ? You're familiar with this, chapter 53. For he grew up before him like a young plant, uh, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. Apparently there was nothing to draw men to Christ physically. But yet, John, the gospel writer, says we've seen his glory. We've seen his splendor. We've seen that brightness of Christ. Well, if it's not his physical attributes, what was it then? I believe it's John coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I believe it's John coming to really and truly know Christ. That as Jesus makes the Father known to John, the Gospel writer, as he becomes the witness of the Father to John, then John not only comes to know the Father, but John also comes to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, the one sent by the Father to love and to serve him. I think that's it. That John sees the glory of Christ because now he comes to know Jesus as his personal Savior. He sees Jesus now through the lens of the cross. As, as John saw Jesus wash his feet. And then as he saw Jesus pick up and carry his cross, as he saw the endless, the boundless love of Christ that Christ had for him, as he heard the beating and the scourging, as he heard the nails and witnessed them being driven into his hands and to his feet, as he heard Jesus cry out, it is finished. As he saw and he went to the empty tomb and then ate with the risen Lord, as he was able to gaze upon the veil torn in two, he saw the glory of Christ. Let me 
ask you, have you seen the glory of Christ? John did. Have you? Are you here today sitting and listening and thinking, I haven't seen this glory? I don't know this glory, but I want to. You may be thinking, you may be even asking in your mind and heart right now, show me this glory. My response would be, I just did. The only way to see this glory of Christ Jesus is first to confess your sins against the one living and true God and to repent of them. The only way to see the glory of Christ is to know that you cannot save yourself. But there is one who came to shed his blood so that you might have life in him. The only way to see the glory of Christ is to trust in his finished work upon the cross and to believe upon the resurrection and to have faith that he died and rose again for you. And as you do, you'll see the glory of Christ. That's what John saw. The glory of Christ is also in his being the only Son of God. You see, in the Old Testament, Father and Son are so, so intimately connected with their names and being begotten. Those things are always pointing to Christ. They're always pointing to the intimate connection that he has with his Father. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. You see, John saw these things. He saw the exaltation of Jesus Christ by his Father. He, he may have witnessed the baptism. I'm not quite sure if he did or not. But at the baptism, God says of his Son, You are my beloved Son. With you I'm well pleased. He certainly saw the transfiguration. He saw the brightness of Jesus. And he heard the Father telling all that were present, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And then he saw Jesus being taken up into heaven. The exaltation of Christ. Because he was the only Son. John saw this. He saw the only Son exalted, glorified in this manner by his Father. And so the glory of the Son is the glory of the Father. John witnessed it. I and the Father are one. And the glory of Christ is also in his being full of grace and truth. And we've already described the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in our first point, haven't we? As we spoke of John seeing the glory of Jesus, we were indeed speaking of the grace of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that John was able to perceive and understand and, and actually see. He knew and understood that he'd been saved by grace and not by his work. And that God had granted John life through Christ by grace. So through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is accurately and finely described by John as being full of grace. And John sees his glory. Well, what about truth? He's not only full of grace, he's full of truth. And this is part and parcel of his glory. Now let's understand this. John is not saying that Jesus is a really well-educated, a good teacher who's able to communicate that which he's learned, and thus he's full of truth. Well, he was a really good teacher. But that's not John, what John was saying as he describes Jesus Christ as being full of truth. Jesus Christ is truth. He's the embodiment of truth. I am the way, the life, and the truth. And actually, I just reversed those two words. But he is, in fact, truth. Jesus Christ said, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Do you see the connection? As we hear Christ, we hear truth. He is the one that you can lean on, that you can rely on, the one who will never forsake nor leave you the child of God, for his word cannot be broken. That's what it is for Christ to be full of truth. 
absolute, unadulterated, pure, undefiled truth. And please don't miss this. And from this fullness, the fullness of grace and truth, we have all received grace upon grace. You see that? What does he mean? The law was of grace. Not that the law saves. It does not say, but it was given for the good of the people of God to help them know their God, His nature, to help them show their utter inability to save themselves, to show them their need for a Savior. And then the patience and long-suffering of God it was grace and the coming of the Messiah it was grace. All grace given for one purpose. To bring glory to the one living and true God. To save a people for His inheritance. Jesus Christ came to finish, to complete that which Moses had given in the law, to become the cursed one and to become the perfect righteousness. And then finally, the glory of Christ is in making the Father known. I'm hoping that you've already seen the irony here. That indeed, Jesus Christ had to veil the glory of his Father by taking on a human nature in order to make the Father known. The glory of God was not seen, it was not rightly appreciated or understood until it was veiled by Jesus Christ. And the remainder of this gospel is then the account of Jesus making his Father known. Yes, John describes the glory of Jesus throughout this text. Let me ask you this morning, how, how do you see Jesus Christ? Do you see him as the culmination of the history of redemption, all things building one upon the other, grace upon grace, to, to get to the ultimate act of grace, the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ? The history of redemption, the building up, the continuing to build to the pinnacle, the cross, the law, the mercy seat where justice and mercy meet. Isn't that, isn't that the fullness of grace? The fullness of his glory will be revealed upon his return. But today, through the scriptures, as somewhat summarized by John here, we have the eclipsing glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. His glory shines so brightly as he points to the Father, as he embodies grace and truth, as he is the only Son and therefore encapsulates and radiates the glory of his Father, and thus enables and grants vision to the children of God to see his glory. How do you see Christ? This may be the better question. How are you responding to the light, to the brilliance of Christ this morning. As Christ came and eclipsed the glory of men, as he came and veiled the glory of God, as he came through the fullness of his grace and truth and revealed his glory to you, how are you responding? Those who watched the eclipse responded with shouting, with tears, with jumping, with dancing, with awe, with joy. They were excited. They were excited. How are you responding? Do you get excited about worship? Do you anticipate it? Do you look forward to it? Do you, do you hear the call to worship and are you filled with joy when you sing hymns which include verses and lines from Scripture? Does it make your heart glad? Would you, when you hear the readings from the Bible, do you want to jump? When you hear sermons preached, as you receive the word of God, the good news, the pure doctrines, does your heart dance? Because again and again, you're seeing the glory of Christ. You might say, we're Presbyterians. Yes. But when we were in, in North Carolina and I heard an amen from the congregation my heart was lifted up. It's okay to say amen once in a while, brothers and sisters. How do you respond? How do you show others what Jesus Christ has done in your heart? That his glory, his glory now resides in you.
Do others know? John the Baptist bore witness about him and cried out. Do people know of the fullness of grace and truth that abides in you? That you've received grace upon grace? That you know Christ savingly? That he's your Lord and Savior? Then all of these things are true for you. The fullness of grace and truth abides in you this morning. As the glory of God is plainly and clearly put on display as the glory of men is redefined and the Lord Jesus Christ shines brightly in and through his human nature. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless us as we know of his fullness, of his grace and truth, as we recognize that we've received grace upon grace so that the Spirit may work within our hearts and our response would tell all those around us, yes, I am filled with the fullness of grace and truth. Praise be to God. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would work powerfully in us by your spirit igniting a, an excitement, a fervor for worship for the Lord Jesus Christ that others would plainly see. For you have placed within us the fullness of grace and truth that we might display the glory of Christ. Help us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen.